Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome very much to a listening session to get input on the Maryland Climate Pathway Report. This is to inform uh, the development of the state's plan that's due at the end of this year to develop um, the policies to achieve Maryland's very ambitious goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions statewide. Um, I want to uh, first and foremost thank the Bowie State family for hosting this event and we're honored to have President Bro here uh, from Bowie State University to uh, welcome you all uh, to this fine university. So President Bro. Yes, it is working. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Oh, my goodness. You have to come up with more energy than that. This is about a very, very important topic. Good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to have you here. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's great to have you here at Bowie State U University, the oldest HBCU in the state of Maryland. And I serve as the 10th president at BSU, and I'm really pleased to have you all here for this very, very important topic. Uh, I don't need to tell you how important it is. You can pick up the newspaper on any given day or just walk outside and you know that something has changed and we need to address uh, climate change in our world. Bowie State University has a long portfolio of activities and initiatives that take place throughout the year. So this topic is very near and dear to our hearts. Before I continue on, I do want to acknowledge and uh, thank NDE for allowing us to host this evening's event. It is truly an honor to have you here. You know, we're no strangers to NDE. We've done quite a lot of work together collaboratively and we look forward to doing even more. So thank you for being here tonight. I'd also would like to acknowledge uh, any elected officials in the audience and thank you for coming out. Could I just ask you to stand if there are elected officials and let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> thank you for your leadership and your support on this important topic. Also, thank you for your support of higher education in the state of Maryland and you being here tonight means a great deal. I just want to highlight a few of the initiatives that are happening here at Bowie State University uh, because there is quite a long list and we're very proud of that. I would encourage you to read our sustainability plan that we have up on our website because we've been at this for a while. We are very pleased with the progress that we've made to reduce our carbon footprint and to uh, reduce uh, emissions uh, throughout the year. We are, this year, we're very proud that we became a tree-designated campus by the Arbor Day Foundation. We have a recycling program that received the Prince George's County Waste Division and Recycling Award. And we have the official campus organization, a group of individual students who are dedicated to our sustainability uh, plan, and that is our Green Ambassadors. As you came into the campus, I hope, when you parked in the parking lot back here, you saw the solar panels. That is part of a larger initiative to reduce our carbon footprint and to create uh, more energy produced by, solar, uh, by the solar panels. About 15% of our energy on the campus is from those solar panels and more to come. You should have also seen some of the charging stations as you parked in the lot right behind us. And these are just some of the initiatives that we have underway. Last year, we were very fortunate to be able to host with MDE a climate uh, action uh, career fair. I encourage you to continue reading on our website about all these different activities and how you can be even a larger part, not just today at this event, but a larger part of all the activities taking place. And so with that, again, I want to thank you for coming out on behalf of the 6,300 students who are enrolled here at Bowie State University, 1,000 employees, I welcome you to BSU. Please don't be a stranger. We would love to show you all of the uh, exciting things that are coming up in this next year. You might have noticed some construction going on beside this building. That is our new Communications, Arts, and Humanities building. We will be cutting the ribbon on that building next October. And as always, our projects are LEED certified projects. So please keep coming back. Thank you for being here tonight for what you are doing here. 
Uh, before I close out, I can't, oh, I'd be remiss if I don't acknowledge someone who's leading the way here at BSU, and that is Mr. Jabari Walker. He heads up our sustainability program. Would you please give him a round of applause? Thank you for what you do, Mr. Walker. And if you have some time after tonight's program, please walk around the campus. It's 330 acres of, of a campus. Right in front of this building is our Center for Natural Sciences, Mathematics, and Nursing. You will notice a greenhouse on the rooftop. That's where we have amazing research taking place along with research in our laboratories that are focused on issues that are facing our society today, such as drought ravaged areas, food insecurity, and so many others. So again, please keep coming back to BSU and don't be a stranger. Enjoy tonight's program and thank you to MDE. Thank you. Thank you, President Bro. Um, so my name is Mark Stewart, and I'm the Climate Change Program Manager at the Maryland Department of the Environment. Uh, MDE is an organization, a uh, state agency that is here to protect the air, land, and water of the state and ensure public health and well-being for all. Um, the Climate Change Program is in the Air Administration of MDE, and we really focus on improving air quality in the state and achieving Maryland's goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, tonight's presentation is a brief overview of the contents uh, that were developed uh, from a study done by our colleagues at the University of Maryland uh, called the Maryland Climate Pathway. And the Climate Pathway is a report that shows how Maryland can achieve its nation leading goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions faster than any other state in the nation. Uh, we're happy to have, be joined by our colleagues at the University of Maryland, um, and I'll be turning over the presentation to them uh, shortly. The quick overview for this evening will give a little bit of background on climate change and then a review of the Maryland Climate Pathway. We'll, we'll break sometime right around uh, 6.30 is our target. Uh, we have some refreshments outside, uh, and if you're looking for a bathroom, the men's room is down this way, and the ladies' room is down that way. Um, and then we'll come back uh, around 6.40, and we'll spend some time with uh, some questions that we have, trying to get some input from you on things that we're contemplating as we develop the, the state's next policies to address climate change. And then we'll, we hope to leave plenty of time for uh, questions and comments that you have to help us uh, inform these policy decisions. So, um, first of all, uh, you are probably here because you're concerned uh, about the state's uh, initiatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and you could be on any side of this, right? You might be very concerned that the state is not moving fast enough. You might be concerned that the state is moving too fast. Uh, thank you for attending. We look forward to hearing your input on this. Part of the reason why we're here and part of the reason why the Maryland General Assembly passed a very ambitious climate uh, law in 2022 is because uh, the climate is changing. Uh, the United States is getting warmer. Maryland is getting warmer. As the heat increases, evaporation increases, precipitation increases, and we wind up with uh, extreme weather events that are affecting many parts of our state. When I was growing up, uh, I grew up in Columbia, Maryland, uh, went to UMBC for undergrad and the University of Maryland for grad school. Uh, I've lived in Maryland almost my whole life. Um, I remember fondly growing up and going skiing at Whitetail and other you know, ski resorts around. Um, last winter, as my kids remind me, there wasn't a single flake of snow, at least not in Silver Spring where I now live. Um, you know, our skiing industry uh, in the Mid-Atlantic is, is uh, a fraction of what it once was. Uh, my family was displaced from uh, historic Ellicott City uh, two times in two 500-year floods, as they're called, uh, that were separated only two years apart. I have friends who live in flood zones and in coastal areas and in the bay and along the uh, eastern seaboard uh, where their homes are at risk to sea level rise and flooding events. Um, my nephew has been suffering from Lyme disease, uh, which is increasingly prevalent because of the expanded uh, territory of, of ticks that carry uh, the disease. 
so on and so forth. There are lots and lots of ways that we are all experiencing climate impacts uh, every day. And these impacts, uh, many of them will continue to uh, get worse through this century as the world works together to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address climate change from its root cause. Maryland is a leader in this space. Uh, we've reduced greenhouse gas emissions faster than just about any other state in the nation. Yes, including uh, California, often touted as the leader in this area. Um, part of Maryland's story is that in 2006, we had 18 coal-fired power plants. Today, we have three. We're on a trajectory to have zero. Um, we have dramatically improved air quality in Maryland. Ma Maryland used to have the worst air quality east of the Mississippi. Uh, last year was our first year where we were in compliance with all of the air quality standards, the federal air quality standards. Uh, now, this year is a little bit of a different year, but it ties right into what we're talking about. We've experienced a number of code red air days because of the poor air quality associated with wildfires burning in Canada, that where the smoke has been affecting the East Coast. Um, there's Unfortunately, not a whole lot that we can do about that directly in Maryland, except for do the things that we're talking about here, which is to try to address the root cause of climate change and to try to prevent the worsening of wildfires globally. But this is part of the new normal. This is part of the global change that we're seeing, and it will continue to get worse for decades to come as we work together to address these emissions. Our goal, given to the state agencies by the General Assembly, is to reduce statewide greenhouse gas emissions 60% by 2031 and achieve net zero emissions by 2045. These are the most ambitious goals of any U.S. state. As soon as this law passed in uh, the middle of 2022, uh, we very quickly called up our friends at the University of Maryland Center for Global Sustainability, who are experts in modeling uh, how uh, states, nations, uh, the world can reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to achieve its targets. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Kathleen Kennedy to talk through the analysis that they conducted to help inform the state's trajectory to achieve our climate goals. Thanks, Mark. My name is Kathleen Kennedy, as you said. I'm an assistant research professor at the Center for Global Sustainability at the University of Maryland, and I was lead author for this report. So the Maryland's Climate Pathway Report um, aims to model a scenario that allows the state to meet its emission reduction goals. We do this by analyzing two scenarios. First, we look at all the current policies that are on the books, both in the state of Maryland and at the federal level, including key policies like the Inflation Reduction Act. And so looking at this scenario allows us to see how close to the goal we can get just with the policies already on the books. And we see that that scenario provides 51% reductions by 2031. So this is already a great start, but there are um, still more reductions needed and there's a gap to be filled. The Maryland's climate pathway scenario provides an inclusive and comprehensive approach to filling that gap and meeting the 60% goal. And it really is crucial to think about this as an all of society approach where we're looking across all sectors, thinking about how all of these different activities in the economy can contribute to these emissions reductions, thinking about how the state can leverage federal policies and work with local governments, NGOs, and all across the state, many different types of organizations to realize these reductions. So I'll start with just a high level view of what this can look like. So we begin with 2006. This is the baseline emissions used for all of these calculations. So it's 60% reductions relative to the 2006 levels. And you can see here, um, the state has already been reducing emissions. So going from 2009, when the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Act was passed, it's been a steadily downward trajectory. And now, uh, with the passage of the Climate Solutions Now Act, We've set the goals um, for 2031 for 60% reductions and net zero by 2045. I'll note that this report does focus primarily on the 2031 goal. So I'll talk about things in context of the 2045 uh, net zero goal when relevant, but most of the time I'm gonna be focusing on the 2031 numbers. 
So with that in mind, let's dive into some of the numbers here. So this is a summary figure that shows the climate pathway, um, including both of those scenarios that I just mentioned. So begin on the left, this is the 2006 baseline, all greenhouse gas emissions in Maryland in 2006. And we need to get from these levels of emissions over to the far right, where we have the 2031 60% reduction. So the first step to do this is the green bar that you see there. And these are the historical reductions that Maryland has already achieved as of the 2020 inventory. And just these historical reductions all we put, all, already put us halfway to the goal. Next, all of these different bars that you see going across are the different sectors of the Maryland economy. And so we model both um, the current policies, which you'll see in the lighter shade of the bar on the top, and the climate pathway scenario, where we layer on additional policies on top of those current policies. And that's the darker color on the bottom of the bar. So the next few slides, I'm gonna walk you through each of these sectors and talk about the different policies that went into that modeling and uh, what that looks like for the sector in particular. So we begin with the electricity sector, which you see there in yellow. And we see that in the climate pathway scenario, the electricity sector can achieve 89% emissions reductions. This is the strongest reduction of any of the sectors. And it achieves this by um, instituting 100% clean energy sources by 2035, by collaborating across Maryland and with neighboring states to make sure that any power that's imported into Maryland is also clean, and by re boosting renewable energy deployment and accessibility through things like federal solar energy tax credits. And so each of these slides is gonna have a chart where you can see the current policy scenario with the dashed line, and then the shaded areas will be the Maryland's climate pathway scenario. So you can see where they diverge uh, based on the additional policies that I just laid out in these bullets. Next in the transportation sector, we see a 49% reduction. And this comes from adding smart growth and zoning reforms that can reduce vehicle miles traveled overall, um, ensuring access to state and federal incentives, adopting the clean fleets regulation that California just put forward, reaching 100% electric bus sales by 2025, and electrifying non-road sources such as lawn care equipment or commercial warehouse vehicles, things like this. In the building sector, the pathway scenario sees a 35% reduction in emissions. And this comes from having zero emission appliances that can improve indoor air quality and safety in addition to reducing emissions. We also include a zero emissions construction standard for all new buildings. And we extend the existing energy efficiency standards that Maryland already has in place. In the industrial sector, we see a 79% reduction. This comes from having buy clean standards for manufactured products, so think about procurement standards for the state. We also model switching fuel use in, cement in the cement industry away from coal. This is something that's already in process by the two cement facilities in the state. Um, one is planning to switch from coal to natural gas, and the other is planning to incorporate more biofuels into their uh, plant. So these are things that are already happening based on industry leadership. We also include the manufacturing sector into carbonization efforts in this scenario. <coughs> Currently, there is an exemption from the GGRA where the manufacturing sector is not um, subject to regulations around greenhouse gas emissions. And so we do remove that exemption in our modeling so that the manufacturing sector is part of those emissions reductions. Next, we have industrial processes and product use, which we see achieving a 46% reduction in emissions. I'll note this is different from the previous slide because the previous slide is just looking at fuel use or combustion emissions. And here it's process emissions, so things like chemical reactions um, that can't be uh, alleviated by just switching to you know, electricity use rather than coal, for instance. So one key strategy here is to lower process-related emission, emissions in the cement manufacturing industry. This can be achieved by material substitutions and other strategies like that. We also use carbon capture and storage to reduce cement emissions in the longer term. So this one does not apply to the 2031 goal, but beyond 2035, it can help the sector. 
We also model a reduction in non-CO2 emissions from air conditioning and refrigeration. Um, these are non-CO2 gases that can be somewhat difficult to abate, but current policies do get us um, a lot of the way there with those as well. Next, we have the fossil fuel sector, which we see getting a 26% reduction by 2031. This comes from reduced natural gas use across all sectors, so it's a cross-cutting measure. We also um, include widespread monitoring of natural gas infrastructure to catch leaks. And we ensure that affordability, and no, um, we do this while ensuring affordability and no increased cost for Marylanders, especially vulnerable communities. And this is a key aspect of the report that we want to uh, really look at how this impacts different people in Maryland and make sure that it's an equitable transition. In the waste management sector, we model a 40% reduction. And this comes from increasing recycling and waste diversion away from landfills and improving access to composting. The agriculture sector only uh, achieves a 9% reduction in our model but this is because it is a somewhat small sector to begin with, and a lot of the emissions here are non-CO2 emissions, which can be a little bit trickier to abate. The state already has a strong practice of implementing climate smart agricultural practices, so expanding that will be crucial. And there are also some opportunities for zero cost mitigation uh, efforts for livestock emissions in particular that we include. And the last sector here is forestry and land use. So you'll note that these emissions are actually negative numbers. So the 2031 goal is just a gross emissions goal, meaning that you don't include any negative emissions, it's only the positive emissions. So this sector is not included in the 2031 calculations, but it is critical for 2045 and the net zero goal. So in particular, um, protecting and expanding these natural sinks such as the Maryland forests will be really crucial to achieving that net zero goal. Because this report did focus primarily on 2031, we don't have extensive analysis of this sector right now, but certainly future work can expand on this. And the last policy I wanna mention is economy-wide. So covering all of the sectors that I just talked about, we model a cap and invest program where the state would set a limit on the emissions across the economy and the proceeds from auctioning off those allowances can be reinvested to support Marylanders and to support the transition. And this policy delivers 4% of the emissions reductions needed from the 60% goal. Taken all together, these policies can provide substantial benefits to Marylanders. So on the emissions reduction side, we hit the 60% target. We contribute to national and global reduction goals by doing so but it also brings significant co-pollutant reductions that can bring health benefits for Marylanders. So the middle column here summarizes some of those health benefits just in 2031 alone. And we see up to 1,000 fewer cases of upper and lower respiratory symptoms, up to 51 lives saved from pollution reduction, and over 16,000 fewer days of restricted activity from pollution. We also see economic benefits from this pathway so these numbers on the far right are cumulative through 2031. And we see those health benefits are between one and about $2.4 billion. The plan also includes 16.7 thousand jobs created and can provide over $1.5 billion increase in personal income. So now I'm gonna to move to a little bit um, different perspective. So instead of just what emissions can be reduced, think about how they can be reduced. And the report does include several considerations about how you can think about this. And each sector is a little bit unique and has its own considerations and opportunities. For the electricity sector, decarbonizing electricity um, also enables decarbonization of other sectors. So thinking about the connections between electricity and the transportation sector and how electrification of buildings will impact that is a key um, point to look at. It's also very important to ensure that the electricity sector transition is equitable. So that's both in terms of those who work in the energy industry, but also for ratepayers and those who might um, be lower moderate income and might be affected by the transition. 
Another equity aspect is making sure that everyone across Maryland has access to the incentives that will enable this, tra this transition, um, particularly at the federal level. In the transportation sector, we can think about overcoming barriers to the electric vehicle transition and reducing vehicle miles traveled. So a key part of this is ensuring affordability and that everybody can, um, in fact, afford to buy an EV. It's also crucial to think about access to charging infrastructure so those who may not be able to put a charger in their own home can still be able to charge a vehicle. And it's also critical to think about access to public transit as an alternative to um, a vehicle so that we can reduce vehicle miles traveled overall. In the building sector, um, we want to think about how to make efficient and clean building technologies available to everyone in the state. So again, affordability is a key consideration here. And also making sure that access is available both to those who own their own home and those who don't. In industry, decarbonizing the industrial sector can be somewhat challenging, but it has a very large untapped potential because of the um, exemption that I men mentioned earlier. To move forward this, with this sector, we want to think about stakeholder engagement and how to work with those industry leaders that are already pursuing emissions reductions. And we also want to think about how research and innovation can help um, deal with those problems where maybe there isn't a perfect solution yet, but more work is needed. Waste management is an opportunity to achieve greenhouse gas emissions reductions as well. Um, it is a key sector for equity, particularly with regard to pollution and thinking about waste incineration and communities that um, may have suffered from that in the past. It's also key to think about waste diversion and just limiting the size of the problem overall. And then the land and agriculture sectors can both contribute to emissions reductions, but also support other goals within the state, such as helping support the Chesapeake Bay. So actions in this sector can improve soil health, they can preserve and expand forest sinks to support the net zero goal, as I mentioned, and they can also improve water and air quality. And with that, I'll turn it back to Mark. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, so we are going to take um, a quick break. Again, there are refreshments outside and are at the table out in the lobby here uh, and men's room and, and ladies room. Uh, Kathleen and I will stay here during the break if you have questions about anything that we uh, just presented. And then when we come back at 640, uh, we will have a few questions for you and then kind of open mic night to hear your, your comments and questions. Uh, about the plan and, and the uh, uh, forthcoming policies. So uh, thank you, and we'll see you back here at 640. So we're, we're going to capture all of your comments, uh, but we also welcome comments online. We have an online survey. If you haven't already picked up your phone and followed that link to it, uh, feel free to do so uh, anytime tonight or anytime really between now and the end of September, which is our period for collecting public input on some of the policy concepts that uh, Dr. Kennedy presented earlier. Uh, there's sort of a, a handy summary, if you will, of, of policies that are kind of on the back of that card. So if you're completely confused and lost about all the th things that we talked about uh, and we'll talk about, uh, that, that's a somewhat handy reference sheet. Um, I want to start off with a, a few kind of survey questions here. So one of the things that you heard about uh, and you might have otherwise read about in the news is that Governor Moore has set an ambitious goal for Maryland to achieve 100% clean power by 2035. By the end of this year, the agencies will recommend a policy to achieve that goal. I'd like your input tonight on what you consider to be clean power. So if you would uh, raise your hand if you consider each of the following, and I'll read off several um, you know, power generation sources. Uh, if you consider each of these to be clean power, right? So the first is solar power. So raise your hand if you consider solar power to be clean power. All right, thank you. Wind power. Thank you. Hydro power. Thank you. Nuclear power. Thank you. 
woody biomass. Okay? And municipal solid waste, or otherwise known as trash incineration. Okay? Thank you. Um, another survey question. Uh, common, common issue, your home heating system breaks. Uh, what do you do? Typically, you, you call up your HVAC contractor and you say, my heat's not working, you know, come fix it, right? Um, we're trying to design policies that encourage contractors to explain the benefits of higher efficiency systems to their customers to break the cycle of old fuel burning equipment being replaced with new fuel burning equipment. By show of hands, how many of you likely rely on a contractor to pick the right heating system for your home? All right, thank you. Uh, how many of you already know to talk to your contractor about the benefits of replacing a fuel piece of fuel burning equipment with heat pumps? Wow, many, okay, that's great. Um, all right. A question uh, that, that might lead to more uh, discussion and input from you. So cars and light duty trucks are the single largest source of climate pollution in Maryland and in the United States. Transitioning to electric vehicles or EVs is critical for achieving the state's climate goals. The best selling car in America right now is an EV, so the transition is well underway. But does anyone here have and want to share any concerns that you have about transitioning to electric vehicles? Uh, also, if there are any EV owners here tonight that have uh, experiences that they want to share, positive or negative, about owning an electric vehicle, uh, then we'd also be interested in hearing your comments on that. Um, we have mics here and here, so if anyone wants to provide input on this question of uh, the transition to EVs, then, then we welcome you to, to come to one of the microphones. Good evening, uh, Ashlyn Thompson, uh, homeowner in Upper Marlboro. Uh, actually, been test driving EVs for the last three or four months. We also, my office runs uh, several um, EV charging related programs. A uh, couple of quick concerns. Uh, one is about the cost uh, for people to upgrade their electrical system. I'm also in real estate too. And there, there are a fair amount of, of folks in our state who are going to need help with upgrading the electrical wiring and infrastructure. We need to have some grants and incentives at some of the housing agencies and community development corporations to help people with that. Um, the second thing is we need to do a lot of education, right? So my office does a lot of education outreach. We'd love to do more with the state in that space um, was very disturbed by the Washington Post um, public opinion poll last month. It showed like 60% of the state um, is uh, resistant to, to EVs. And part of that is the lack of education, marketing. Um, it's also about uh, just the fear of the unknown like computers were in the late 80s and, and early and throughout the 90s. So we gotta do some education, we gotta do some outreach and we also got to make sure that um, so much of the state does not have single family homes. So we need to start coming up with a plan on how we're going to retrofit and replace um, some of these uh, traditional fueling stations and make sure they offer EVs but also biofuels as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hello, um, Joseph Chikuda, Mount Rainier, Maryland. And I guess my biggest concern is that the weight of the electric vehicles, our vehicles are already getting much bigger, um, and then electric vehicles with the weight of the battery are just going to increase the weight and size. And as a bicycle commuter and a parent of two young children, the safety concerns with getting hit by one of these heavier vehicles um, that are often quieter too is very concerning. Plus, also just the idea of continuing to build a road network that's focused on driving solely so that leaves out the young, that leaves out the aging, that leaves out the active commuters and the active and the pedestrians. It worries me we're going to continue down that cycle and, and, harm, and also the land use implications and all that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. 
Hi there. Thank you, thank you for holding this and all the meetings that you're going to be holding and taking our comments into consideration. I appreciate that. Um, I think some of us are wondering from the climate report how much carbon-based fuel, such as coal and natural gas, will go into the electrical grid that you'll need to charge all the EV batteries. We'd really like to see that answered. And also, um, with both solar and um, wind, we would like some of that built instead of farmlands or, or industrializing our ocean, which is highly problematic. We would like it studied a bit more, especially on the industrializing ocean part. And um, and to consider other places, instead of farmland, what about you know rooftops of buildings, et cetera? So those are some of our major concerns. There's also a lot of underplaying of um, where some of the, the, this equipment comes from. Um, we know all solar panels, or most of them, come from China, for instance. So we don't want to leave ourselves in a position of being vulnerable. There's also a lot of pollution considerations. And new studies have come out, even in the last week, showing that with solar blades, for instance, um, or solar panels, sometimes it can take um, up to three or four years to, to overcome the uh, pollution, and in that time, the blades or the panels have to be um, replenished or replaced. So we just want to make sure that all of these um, I's are dotted and T's crossed. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're reminding me, I just caught in the news recently that uh, solar panels are now, thanks to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, cheaper uh, to produce in the US than in China. I don't know if you happen to be more up to speed on these studies than I am, but um, but yeah, I, I hear you in terms of uh, you know the the history of importing most of the PV panels from China, but I understand that the manufacturing is rapidly shifting to being domestic. Um, so we'll hear these two last comments on the subject of EVs, and then um, uh, we'll we'll switch topics from there. Hey, good seeing you. Hello. Uh, my name is Jose. Uh, I, I do have an EV, and I want to uplift maybe the concerns of communities where almost everyone rents. It's all apartment buildings. Think of Langley Park, for example. I used to live there, and I go there all the time. In that whole area, for a population of over 20,000, there are only four chargers. But right now, they're almost always empty. But with four chargers, though, if everybody in the community starts to transition, more people start to buy uh, electric vehicles, four chargers are not going to be enough. So just considering places that uh, having one in your own home is not, it's not possible. Great, thank you. Hi. Uh, Andre Crooms from Upper Marlboro. Um, I've been an EV owner actually since I converted my first EV in 2003. It was a 1974 Volkswagen Super Beetle. Um, but it's still a pain in the butt. We are vastly underinvesting in this infrastructure. I have 14, I just counted them, apps on my phone to charge my car at every potential different uh, charging station. It's just not to the point that it's user friendly. I mean, we, we worked on the workplace charging challenge back in 2008 and discovered a lot of these problems and we're still having these problems in 2023. So we, we have to think about people and how people really use vehicles. Um, and although I don't think the EVs are the only answer to this, this problem, it's one big answer, but we really have to be human centric in the way we design this. Um, and the way we think about it, we have to be human centric in the zoning, we have to be human centric in the solutions, and we just, we just have to make it easier. Easier for everyone to use it on a smartphone, easier for everyone to not use it on a smartphone, uh, easier for the people who are unbanked, um, easier for folks who have you know, uh, ability challenges, all of those things. So just need to put the human back in the situation, and also we need to think about vehicle size that was mentioned by Mr. Takuda, but um, that I also just want to link that to extractivism, right? Um, we have the largest cars, so we have the largest batteries, which means we're using the most of these materials that we need to use for batteries, which is a security challenge for the United States. We don't, one, we don't want to be having people who are, you know, essentially being enslaved, working in many of these mines to extract these, you know, these materials when we could be using less of them by thinking again about what we should have thought of 40 years ago when we started doing you know, vehicle standards, which is that our cars do not need to be so darn big. 
Thank you. And um, I really appreciate the comments because it also reminds me that I don't mean to suggest that the state's only focus on decarbonizing the transportation sector is by transitioning to electric vehicles. And in fact, of course, the state invests very heavily in, in public transit. Governor Moore has some gold, bold plans around expanding public transit, uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled. It's an important part of the, the pathway report. So we're looking at a range of options to address these issues for sure. Um, thank you. I've got, let's see, uh, one more before open mic night. Um, uh, the state government, as you heard from, from Kathleen earlier, is currently prohibited from requiring manufacturers in Maryland to reduce climate pollution. Uh, the University of Maryland has produced two reports now suggesting that the state should lift that prohibition and allow the manufacturing sector to participate in climate pollution reduction programs. Would anyone here like to share an opinion on including or continuing to exempt manufacturers in the state from the state's plans to reduce climate pollution? Also fine if you don't have an opinion on that. Could you, yeah. could you, could you explain that again? Yeah, in 2009, the General Assembly passed the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Act. There's a line in there that says that the state cannot adopt regulations specifically to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, manufacturers in the state. Uh, the General Assembly at that time also called for there being a study done to determine is that prohibition needed. Uh, the University of Maryland, Kathleen's team, uh, did that study, delivered it to the General Assembly, was that last year? It's all blending together. Last year, um, and, and basically found that you know, there, there are lots of opportunities to decarbonize the manufacturing sector. And actually one of the things that we've heard from the manufacturing sector, uh, and, and important to note, in Maryland, when we're talking about the manufacturing sector, through the lens of greenhouse gas emissions, we're primarily talking about cement manufacturing. There are two cement manufacturing plants that produce the lion's share of manufacturing sector emissions in Maryland. Um, and uh, those facilities have, have kind of expressed their interest in uh, seeing value in carbon price programs, right? They're, they're decarbonizing faster in places like Canada and Europe that have some sort of carbon pricing scheme. Um, so that is part of the reason why it's an open question for us, and I think that, and feel free to expand on this, but um, why the University of Maryland uh, suggested that that, that uh, prohibition could probably be lifted in a way that is, is supportive of the industry's own voluntary efforts uh, and commitments to uh, achieve net zero emissions. And in the cement, in the cement industry, that industry has a, has a goal industry-wide of achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, yes, uh, a comment on that, um, that we could look at a third option as opposed to a yes or no, but a more expansive option that would look at transparency, where we ask industry to disclose and to also measure looking at scope one, two, and three emissions. Um, I am concerned about the cement uh, manufacturing, and I do know that there is a new way to do it, but I also know that there are um, ways that are being investigated that would be way better than the supposed new way that are coming online fairly soon. So, um, you know, being very transparent, I'm very concerned about data centers, and I know that Maryland is working hard to compete against Virginia to get the data centers to move here, and they are incredibly problematic data centers, as is, you know, data period. So I do think that um, really disclosing, measuring, and disclosing um, like they do in the EU could be a very helpful path, and we can always name, blame, and shame those who are problematic. Thank you. Hey. Hi, thanks so much. Um, as complicated an economic question as that I'm sure it turns out to be, um, it sounds like the fundamental question that it boils down to is what do we that cause manufacturing to leave the state, which is obviously what we don't want. It's just not in my backyard and it's somewhere else the emissions continue. Um, at the same time, it sounds like the goal is also pushes close to that line of it leaving the state as possible. When we look back in history at these moments, we're talking about the sixth mass extinction, right? Like, 
as a nation, as a world, we should be 100 times moving faster than we are right now. Like this is, we're moving through a lot of compromise. It seems like, especially in the state of Maryland right now, you know, we have a trifecta in the state government. We have an opportunity actually, you know, strike while the iron's hot and make some progress. Um, and uh, so looking at these balance, you know, without tipping the glass so far that, you know, that manufacturing leaves and it just happens somewhere else besides here. Um, and that sounds like a good place to pressure. Thank you. I really appreciate all that input. Um, and, and especially because it was input on the questions that I threw at you. Uh, so we have roughly uh, 30 minutes left for tonight's event and would be really interested in hearing really any other thoughts that you have, things that the state should keep in consideration as uh, the state develops the GHG reduction plan, which again is, is due by the end of December of this year. Um, and uh, you know, also of course still open to any questions that you have about the report that was done, the modeling that, that was done. Uh, so really, feel free to, to line up and, and tell us what you got. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed your presentation. I can tell you put a lot of work into it. Here we are in one of the premier African-American upper education facilities in the United States. I don't see many African-Americans here tonight, but someone's got to speak up for this area. I looked at all your slides. I did not see one single instance where you mentioned the word nuclear. I didn't see one single instance where you mentioned Calvert Cliffs, which is less than one hour away from where we're sitting tonight. Calvert Cliffs provides 36% of Maryland's electricity, 80% of Maryland's emissions-free electricity. So why should we double that plant? It would provide a lot of tax relief for Southern Maryland and Prince George's County. It would provide thousands of jobs for Prince George's County and Southern Maryland. Nuclear energy works when the wind isn't blowing, when the sun isn't shining, 24-7. I took a tour of Calvert Cliffs when it was first built in 1975. There has never been a problem or incident at Calvert Cliffs. It works 100%. It works perfectly. So I can't understand why you haven't gone in depth into expanding Calvert Cliffs nuclear plant. And as a candidate for the U.S. Senate, filed with the FEC, the very first thing I'm going to do after the election is to file legislation requiring the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is located in Maryland, it's right here, you haven't been in communication with them evidently, requiring them to explore doubling Calvert Cliff's plant. It provides electricity to over one million homes in Maryland. Why not make it two million homes? We're talking about EV stations. We're talking about bringing in 1,000 or thousands more EVs into Maryland. They're going to need electricity. Why not use the emissions-free electricity that comes from an expanded Calvert Cliffs nuclear plant? So, that's my message to you. I think you need to make some changes in your slides. You need to go back, talk to the NRC. You need to go and talk to the people at Calvert Cliffs because that's the solution to having a clean emissions Maryland and meeting these emissions goal. And I can tell you, I'm gonna be talking about that during the whole campaign season from now till November, 2024. I'm Robin Ficker. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the hard work that you've done. Thank you, Mr. Ficker. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Laszlo Mizrahi, and I'm a newly appointed member of the Climate Change Commission, and I really appreciate all your amazing work and look forward to being a part of your success. Um, as you're working on the actual tactics and plan, 
I do have some very specific questions that I want to lift up. Uh, some of them you cannot address. It needs to be addressed by the legislature, and I know that we have uh, probably the best uh, environmental legislator in the state in the room. And so I want to mention that the plan does outline on pages 82 to 84 um, what some of the implications are if some of our climate plans aren't implemented perfectly or on schedule and yet the whole agenda of your plan assumes everything's happening perfectly. So that structurally, in my opinion, seems to set us up for failure because not everything will happen perfectly and on time. Uh, so that worries me. I'm also worried that we're not consistent with the EU or the Paris Accord in terms of following scope one, two, and three in terms of admissions. And so um, I wanted to see also as you think about the manufacturers as a positive state that you're doing a cost-benefit analysis on this and extending it, as I mentioned earlier, well beyond the cement factories. I think the SEC, which is looking at public disclosure of publicly traded companies, has a really good proposal uh, nationally, but it hasn't passed yet. And it would be interesting to see if our Maryland controller could talk about publicly traded companies and their uh, public disclosure on their emissions as they're doing in Europe. Um, we have a lot of ways that you know people can play games. Like if you move the cement factories to Virginia, that doesn't make the planet safer. It just makes our numbers look better, uh, but it doesn't help anybody. Um, as we do this, um, I really love that you include agriculture, food, and infrastructure. And I'd love to see our state do much more in this. I'd love to see us utilize BIRD, which is a special relationship between the University of Maryland and Israel on high technology. It just got a $70 million plus up from Kamala Harris just this past week, the day after she came to our state to another HBCU to talk about um, some of the climate goals, specifically around climate. It's a new $70 million program I would love to see Maryland take advantage of that. I also agree that we need communications and education so that people will want to electrify their homes, would want to have, perhaps, alternative proteins, so that our public schools wouldn't want to have hamburgers and might want to instead have fish sandwiches because of the carbon impact. But that takes an actual budget and an actual communications um, strategies. I just want to also mention two other issues. Um, of the new improvements that we're looking for in the report, it suggests that 40% of those new improvements will come from a cap invest program, which is very loosely and briefly outlined in the report. New York is already doing this, California has done some, and California just implemented it. But it's very optimistic to think we're gonna get that much savings in terms of our greenhouse gases, and I hope that we'll look um, very aggressively what others have done and modeled. Lastly, we talk in the report, or you talk in the report a lot about vulnerable populations. I think we need to really specify individuals with disabilities because people tend to think about frontline communities as those next to the coal plant. But if you're a person on an electric wheelchair or oxygen or you have other disabilities, um, evacuation during a climate crisis is very challenging. I'm thrilled that we have um, interpreters here for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, having captions is also quite critical and other accommodations. This is a very important thing for Maryland because there are more than 600,000 people with disabilities in Maryland and the majority of Marylanders do have a loved one with a disability. Thank you for your tremendous work. Thank you very much. I, I thought you were going for the mic. No. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll just say briefly, the, the Cap and Invest program that we model is intended to be a sort of generic um, placeholder. So we don't get into details on that. That would be up to the legislature to decide how they would want to implement that. Um, but the, the examples that you list are a good place to start looking at that, I would say. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, thanks. I'm Brian O'Malley. I'm the president of an advocacy organization called Central Maryland Transportation Alliance based in Baltimore. 
Um, I want to thank you for showing there's a pathway to achieve the target um, by 2031 of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 60% relative to 2006 levels. And thank you for pointing out that if we pursue that pathway, there will be benefits to human health, there will be economic benefits, and thank you for acknowledging that the burdens of pollution are not borne equally by all Marylanders, but are uh, the brunt of which is, is borne by low-income people of color and people living in, in flood-prone areas. But I also have um, suggestions. I want to see the pathways be stronger and more clear on VMT reduction. Um, we, we chase the, the conversion to electric vehicles like a bright, shiny object, but sometimes we overlook the, the policies that um, will help us do the necessary and essential part of reducing vehicle miles traveled, how much we all drive. We reduced vehicle miles traveled from mid-2000s until 2014, so it, it is doable, but we've been growing it ever since and growing it per capita. We're all driving more. Um, sadly, just this morning, the Baltimore Regional Transportation Board unanimously approved a plan to increase vehicle miles traveled per capita all the way until 2050. And that's not going to help address this crisis. It's not the pathway to, to reach the target. Um, in the Pathways Plan, it's disappointing that the additional policies recommended only reduce vehicle miles traveled between 2025 and 2030 by 0.67%. That's, that's not enough. Um, and, and that would be, in 2030, higher than it was in 2020. So we, we need to use this decade to make progress, not go further into the hole. Um, and so policies that could achieve this include flexing the big federal formulas that come to Maryland every year that our previous Secretary of Transportation called highway formulas, but they're really surface transportation formulas that could be spent on things that would achieve that result. Things like bike and pedestrian facilities and public transportation. Um, we often hear people say, how are we ever going to pay for the public transportation expansions? But we expand roads every year. We haven't expanded public transportation in the Baltimore region since the late 90s. Um, so we need to shift our priorities, and, and I'd like to see the Pathways Plan be more explicit about how to do it. Thanks. Thank you very much. And you all are just on point. <laughs> This, this is great. I, I'm really appreciating all this input. Yes, sir. I might not be. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Fenwick from Hartford County. First, I appreciate the legislature taking steps in the right direction. I think they took a couple of wrong steps, but generally the goals are good. I appreciate the modeling and the effort that went into modeling what happened. That said, this is a nice program and we're in a crisis. Those two things don't go together. The goal is wrong. Net zero was a good goal when 350 was the atmospheric content. We're at 418. If you don't, anybody looks around knows we're screwed if we can't take stuff out of the atmosphere. So net zero doesn't get us there. Second, you don't define net zero very well anyway. You seem to be willing to make too much energy and ship it out of state and claim that's net zero. It's not. You're shipping, have to ship in clean energy which kind of gets back to his point that we've got to go with more nuclear. Not necessarily the capital flips old model, but the new stuff that actually you can use to burn spent nuclear fuel. Step four, you didn't, there's almost no, nothing in the plan on clean energy production, how we're going to get it done. Offshore wind is about 40% efficient, at least 60% of the time you're not getting good energy. We can't deliver. And they were talking about disability people. I got some in my house. If the lights go out, we're dead. Okay, other thing. Just on offshore wind alone, 51 billion. There's no way to spend that equitably. I know it's in the tax bill, it's not in the thing, but you, you can't have equity. You probably can't keep the Democratic coalition together if you're spending that kind of money and not reaching your goal. Couple things. I think you can continue the best parts of the plan, which is the energy efficiency, um, including some deployment of renewables, especially on rooftops. I think you got to start to look at nuclear. There's 50 developing. There's five already available in America. Just this week, a DC company shipped out $2.75 billion in nuclear reactors to Europe because we won't buy them and we don't even look at them in Maryland. 
these little 20 megawatt things. Um, we need a real plan for capturing greenhouse gas that actually takes the carbons and other greenhouse gases and puts them into a, some sort of material that can be used, carbon fibers, something we can replace on the cement with. Just in terms of uh, administration, we need a climate czar. We need somebody, male or female or young or old, who can say, we gotta do these, here's how we're gonna get them done, and have some power to do it. Uh, given you're gonna spend that much money, we need a climate auditor. Uh, I think the Department of Energy is, is the right department for figuring out the energy stuff, and the Department of Environment is the wrong one. They, they should keep looking at mitigation and the damages of climate change, but they aren't the people that could come up with an energy plan. You are the people to figure out how to, to, what the damages are gonna be and how we stop them. I'm gonna stop with that. Oh, also, anybody wants to meet and see if we can do something to push the government forward, I'm gonna stand in the back of the room after the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, my name is Joseph Jacuna, and I'm speaking as the lead volunteer of the Climate Parents of Prince George's, and we advocate for 100% clean energy schools. Uh, the, uh, the two things I wanted to say, both related to the need for more emphasis on our school system in this plan. The first is that those 16,700 jobs are going to be wonderful for Maryland, and they need to make sure they're going to Marylanders. In particular, there needs to be investment in career technical education programs to make sure our students are being trained for these good career jobs. The, the school systems are trying, but they don't, have the, they don't have all the resources and all the expertise to put together uh, new vocational programs for all these new areas. There needs to be policies set up at the state level to help them out with that, as well as funding. The second area when it comes to schools is that our schools are a great learning opportunity for the society at large. I don't know if you've ever been to Hollaberg up in Boston, <coughs> but it's a net zero school, which is great for our, our school's emissions. It's gonna save the school system money when it comes to um, energy use in the long term, but it's also great for the students to be able to take this home. There are solar panels right visible that the students can learn about. There is heat pump systems carved out of the wall so the students can see a heat pump system I guess, in action as they walk down the halls. And they're going to be able to take this information back to their parents and explain to them what's going on with Because I, I don't know, I'm of the generation where no one recycled. But when we went to school, we learned about it and we brought it back to our parents. And I, I know my parents would not be recycling if it wasn't for what I learned in school. And our students are going to be a great avenue, a great ambassadors to make sure this change is happening. I know this stuff is harder to model, so sometimes it gets left out. But I hope you, in, as you go forward with this plan, include this kind of work in the plan. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Um, I'm with a group of seniors. Uh, we call ourselves Senior Stewards Acting for the Environment. Uh, part of the plan that I've been quite interested in here is the, is the waste component. Uh, and because uh, Methane is so much more difficult than, than carbon. I've been particularly concerned with, uh, with methane emissions associated with, uh, with waste. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what your plan is calling for with regard to that, but that's a critical issue that just has to be addressed. So I guess I'll, I'll say one thing and then uh, pass that question to Kathleen, that Maryland is one of only two states that shifted to what, this is a little bit nerdy, but we, we now measure the impact of greenhouse gases on a 20 year horizon instead of using the standard 100 year horizon. And, and the effect of that is that short lived climate pollutants like methane have now a much more amplified role in the state's total emissions which means that measures to reduce things like methane um, are even more important now uh, in order to achieve the, the goal of a 60% reduction. So that's just kind of one component. And then I don't know if you want to elaborate on sure. waste measures. Yeah, so the, the main modeling um, that we did for the waste sector was looking at the uh, landfill regulations that the state already has in place. And so we use an estimate of the reductions there 
but we also layer in as an additional policy in the pathway um, more diversion efforts and more uh, moving to things like composting that can in fact work to eliminate those emissions. So that's absolutely part of it, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, good evening. Bob Calloway from uh, right here in Bowie. I'm also a member of the Bowie Green team. Uh, thank you for being here. This has been enjoyable, really, to hear all this uh, passion from everybody. Um, I understand this is a, you know, you look at this from the, the state level. What I didn't see is how the state is going to coordinate with the local governments to make this plan happen. You know, it's good that you have a, a plan, but how do you work with the different cities and counties to flow down money and uh, expertise and like that to make it happen. Um, I didn't see anything about a residential uh, electrification transition type plan. I know you mentioned, you know, residential electrification, but how are you going to use the IRA to get the word out and the money out to residential uh, homes and like that to convert from natural gas, methane, to uh, heat pump technology? Not just with heating, but hot water, dryers, there's all kinds of things. And also uh, convert uh, gas ranges to induction stoves. Um, kind of an admin question. Will these slides be available that you presented tonight online anywhere? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, a lot of talk about... Uh, you know, transportation is one of the largest sources of greenhouse gas in Maryland. We want to go EVs. Well, transportation tax revenues are generated through gas tax. How are we going to replace that big hole in making sure the roads and bridges are uh, in good shape? Is there going to be a vehicle miles traveled type formula where everybody's going to have to report their miles? So, and Let's see. Is there going to be a plan to incentivize renewable energy sources? You know, like solar and wind? I don't know. So those are my questions. Thank you very much again. Thanks. And you make me want to uh, host an another event to address all of these issues. Oh, so very quickly, um, uh, Maryland was the, the first state to apply for um, uh, something called the, the uh, it's an EPA grant program that's giving us $3 million to coordinate between the state and the local governments on the implementation of measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to identify priority emission reduction projects uh, to apply for competitive funding from the EPA to help invest in acro across the state uh, at the county level um, in those emission reduction projects. So that's something that, that is underway. Um, and I'll be happy to, to yeah, connect you with the person on our team that's managing that grant program. Um, home electrification, a uh, quick note, uh, starting this year, everyone's uh, eligible to get a 30% federal tax credit on uh, new heat pump systems. Um, starting likely in the beginning of 2024, the Homes and Here rebate program uh, will be available to uh, low, moderate, and, and middle-income households in Maryland. Uh, that'll be administered through the Maryland Energy Administration, and that's on track to for those rebate dollars, uh, upfront rebate dollars, to start rolling out uh, quarter one of 2024. Um, and, yeah, that, and, and also, you mentioned tax revenue. Yes, that's, that's a big topic uh, for really every state to, to be looking at. Um, and there was, uh, there, there's a, um, I'm forgetting the, the title of it, uh, but, but basically a task force at the state level to look at exactly that issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. My name's Janet Gingold, and I'm the chair of the Prince George's County Sierra Club. Here in Prince George's County, we are very proud of our new curbside uh, compost pickup program. Diverting food waste and other organics will help reduce methane emissions from landfill. Still, much work needs to be done to get the most out of this great program. On my block in Kettering on a Monday morning when the trucks come by, mine is the only green bin on our block. It's, it's discouraging. It's an example of how a great user-friendly policy won't work 
if the people are not engaged in actually doing what needs to be done. Maryland Climate Pathways Report provides a great to-do list for decreasing greenhouse gas emissions from transitioning to clean and renewable energy, electrification of vehicles, decreasing vehicle miles traveled, reducing methane emissions from landfills, agriculture and natural gas infrastructure, protecting our natural carbon sinks, all of this sounds great. However, setting policies and goals is not sufficient to actually make these things happen. We need to invest more in outreach and communication strategies that bring the people into the effort so that every household composts food waste and the general population is ready to adopt the new, more efficient, and low emissions technologies that we need to reduce our collective emissions. This requires both leadership and meaningful community engagement. One important element that didn't make it onto the list on page 15 is battery energy storage. The transition away from our dependence on fossil fuel generated electricity will require battery storage and many acres of solar panels along with offshore wind. But where are we going to put these things? And who decides? And how do they decide? Our aging grid needs a smart makeover that distributes the risks and benefits fairly. The grid of the future requires planning in the best interests of the people, not just what happens to be convenient and profitable for the industry. We need a transparent regulatory framework and safety protocols so that early adopters can trust that all reasonable safeguards are in place. We need distributive justice so that all have access to reliable, affordable, clean energy and no community needs to bear an unfair, unfair burden of the environmental degradation. We need procedural justice that involves people in decision making, respecting their knowledge, taking their beliefs and values into consideration, and addressing their concerns. People need reliable information to counter misinformation about new, in, new technologies. And planners need to meet people where they are, listen and learn from them about what will help bring necessary change. We need restorative justice that intentionally builds in protection and benefits for neighborhoods that have been historically unfairly burdened by environmental degradation and the resulting health disparities. If people can't trust the system, all these laudable goals and policies won't bring the change we need fast enough. Sessions like this one are very important, but we need to do more to include the general public in creating the change that we need. We need government officials who lead by example, and we need more social marketing, and we need meaningful community engagement starting yesterday. Thanks. Thank you. I'm also noticing the time. So we have about two minutes until uh, the, the scheduled end for the event. Um, I think that we'll have time for, for one and maybe two more comments uh, before, I, I don't want to hold anyone. Um, I'm happy to stay uh, a little bit later to, to talk one-on-one -on -one with any, anyone else who's already in, in line. Um, but, but otherwise, why don't we take maybe two more comments and then um, you know, feel free to grab any cookies on the way out if there are still any. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll <clears throat> try to be quick. I'm Pamela Boozer-Struther, Prince George's County resident of the town of Brentwood. I'm also the uh, Prince George's County Public Schools Board of Education member for District 3, representing very urban areas of the county, including Hyattsville and, and Langley Park. I want to thank Joseph Jacuda, my co-chair on the Prince George's County Public Schools Climate Change Action Plan, who you've heard from and welcome all students, alum, and staff of PGCPS who are in the room this evening, and I'd love to say hello before you leave tonight. Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that um, our school system, 20th largest in the nation, uh, became an instant national leader on climate action when our plan was released a year ago. Um, and we are now working, we, we also can say we are the only, the large school system that has an alignment with a county plan with Director Crooms and County Executive Alsa Brooks and the climate action in the climate solutions now and all the legislation in Maryland. Um, I want to echo our Bowie Green team uh, colleague here who talked about alignment. We need that. We, we really need you to understand what's happening way at the ground level because when we talk about the conversion of electric buses, yes, the marketplace is there. We can do this. And I appreciate the, the goals have been moved up. But we, the ground level issues are just not as like sexy and interesting, right? 
We, are, we have bus lot issues, bus lot conversion, where these bus lots are, can we get them be equitable in the plan where they're located? Those are the hard things we're dealing with. And, and that's not where like the funding and the, the thinking is going. It, public schools infrastructure has been neglected for decades and we are trying to do this planning in that context. And we really need that intersection of uh, school infrastructure and this plan uh, to be successful. Um, we need support of you know, big goals that we have, like clean energy uh, headquarters for PGCPS with um, you know, have the central kitchen for, for climate friendly food, urban garden, all in one place so we could eliminate these 40, 50 old buildings that the land might be inside the beltway where we could put electric bus lots. And they are also the least healthy and least energy efficient. And these are where we put our central office staff. And of course, our children are still in some of these buildings that we are working on. So we, we need that level of understanding about the, how difficult this is going to be and how that's not the conversation. You know, I mean, our students are doing amazing things. We are environmental justice, equity curriculum. Their composting is moving really fast through the buildings through green team adoption. Those are the things we can do, but this infrastructure problem, we need you to really understand that level and understand where we're intersecting with Director Crooms on these aligned plans so that we could move more quickly together. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks also for pointing out a lot of what we have been talking about here and a lot of what we think about at NDE are these you know, big kind of blunt policies, right? And where the rubber meets the road is project financing, project implementation. So uh, thank you for highlighting some of the the, the you know uh, work that you're doing, and uh, for the the reality that a lot of these policies they have to align all the way through to project implementation. That's, that's very critical. Thanks. All right, we'll, we'll we'll take this one, and then again, I'm happy to stay a little bit later to hear more comments. Yeah, I'm Ruth Alice White. Um, as you know, uh, I've been part of Howard County Climate Action and the Howard County Sierra Club, which in um, October 2020 started studying the issue of electrification of new buildings. Um, Howard County, that culminated in Howard County passing a law to, to study the how the county council could do that in building codes next year but building codes are key. That isn't gonna happen until the building codes are changed. And I totally support um, the requirement to, to um, stop selling uh, methane emitting home appliances by 2030, but people have talked about the emergency. And you know, it's, it's great that Maryland finally <laughs> went to a counting methane over 20 years, but a couple of years ago, the IPCC said, unless we dramatically reduce methane, we're, we're sort of toast. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, we will not reverse, we will not slow down the climate crisis we are in if we dramatic, don't dramatically address the issue of methane fossil gas that's used in home appliances and elsewhere. Um, so um, uh, that can't happen soon enough, and building codes that stop compounding the problem of installing new um, methane emitting appliances in homes can't come fast enough. Um, secondly, um, the report said you're going to monitor gas infrastructure to reduce leaks, but we know that the, the gas pipelines throughout <coughs> Maryland that deliver gas to homes are, are tremendously leaky. And I don't know how you're going to stop um, that. We need to get, uh, we need to switch over to electric appliances. But um, the report has nothing about the uh, Stride program and the, the tremendous incentives the utilities get um, to work on pipelines. Um, and that is a key thing to address. Um, uh, secondly, um, We've been advocating with groups in Maryland that oppose the incinerator for several, the incinerators, the two incinerators in Baltimore, and in Maryland, but especially the Baltimore incinerator, for several years. 
Um, it gets uh, subsidies from the RPS, um, the unrenewable portfolio standard. Um, it has a lot of things in it that, that we really consider dirty energy, not renewable. Um, and we'd like, to, we'd like the subsidies uh, through the RPS for the incinerator to stop. But really, the whole RPS structure is so broken <laughs> and needs to be reformed. Um, the report does not indicate um, there's a carve out to incentivize wind and solar, but we're way behind on meeting the goals for that carve out. And the report doesn't say how we're going to uh, catch up and even uh, meet those minimal goals that are already in law. Um, uh, I think that's it. Thank you. I mean, there's more I could say, but <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and so let, let's let's pause and um, uh, let me thank you all for coming out tonight and sharing this input. Uh, I really really appreciate it, and I know that my my team's been taking some notes too um, that we can digest in the office tomorrow. Um, but but I also want to respect the time of our interpreters. Thank you very much for for being here. colleagues in our uh, MDE communications department that's been videotaping. I don't want to hold you any later either. So, so we'll officially wrap the program. Thanks again. And um, uh, please, if you're already in line, uh, happy to talk to you after the event. So thank you very much.